We've got fall camp updates, Olympic Horn Frog medalist updates, commitments, basketball schedule stuff, a baseball player that's pretty key to 2025 is on his way back to Fort Worth instead of major leagues. We've got all that and more on this episode of Frogs Insider. Hello and welcome into another episode of Frogs Insider. Jamie Plunkett here alongside Melissa Trebowasser. This is episode number 74, I believe. You know what else this, this episode is significant because of, Jamie? You, it's your first episode back in town. I am you in town. I have, no, the, I have nothing. I have nothing. I can hear the echo in your yes, AirPods. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, you made the long trek from Sacktown back to Fort Worth. How I know you, I mean, we saw the pictures in the group text of all the beautiful places you stopped along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the uh, national parks? I saw some really nice shots of your meals. Um, yeah. but what was the, I, what was I, the I best stop? Food. What was the best stop you made on the way back town? Back, uh, back to you town. know, look, I, I want to say the best stop was the welcome to Texas sign. I feel like that's the <laughs> one, but except that I accidentally blew right by it because I was just at that point, like so sick of being in the car, but I was a huge fan of Zion and Arches national parks, um, mm, yeah. Utah, like not a lot of reason to hang out in Utah for me personally, but, um, uh, I will say just absolutely beautiful place to drive through. Um, I managed to, the route I went took me through Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. I felt like I saw a large swath of the country. Um, but the two national parks, like I highly recommend anybody that's thinking about going out to Salt Lake City in October, um, if you can work in a long weekend and, and swing by any of the national parks in uh, in Utah, I highly recommend it. It was it was fun. B uh, Bauer, my dog, and I. You guys all know because he's always obnoxious during these recordings. Um, him and I took a nice little hike through Zion. It was pretty cool. So I think that's that awesome. was that was probably my favorite place. Heck yeah! I have not been to the national parks in Utah yet. I've d I've done most of the Southwest, but I haven't made my way up to Utah. So that's definitely on the list. And yeah, yeah. you're right. There's a good excuse for frog fans to get up there later this year when the TCU Horn Frogs are playing the Utah Utes in a Big Twelve conference game. Crazy thing to say, but uh, it's like we never yeah. left. That's you know? the that's the reality. The rivalry yeah. is revived if you will. Um, Melissa, we've got so much to cover. So we haven't done one of about. these in about a week and a half. And things have been happening in the world of TCU athletics. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Just to give y'all who are listening a little bit of a, a primer here, we are going to spend a good amount of time talking about fall camp. Um, mm -hmm. So don't worry. We are going to talk about all so the things we've camp. seen. We are seven practices deep into fall camp now. We've had multiple opportunities to talk to Sonny Dykes. We talked to both the offensive and defensive coordinators today. Uh, we've seen a lot of team um, practice during these fall camps so far. Uh, we're going to break it all down for you. But first, we got to talk about what's going on over in Paris, France, because some Horn Frogs over there have been absolutely crushing it in the Paris Olympics this year, Melissa. Um, let's start with one of the, the Horn Frogs that has not been getting as much attention as she probably should have been getting during this run. That's Nigerian basketball player Amy Okonkwo. Okonkwo played four years here at TCU, was one of the leading scorers during her time here for a couple of TCU women's basketball teams that were pretty salty at times. Um, and she has been playing for the Nigerian national team for several years now. And she had a great Olympics. She Incredible. dropped 13, 13 points in an upset win over number four ranked Australia that got Nigeria out of pool play into uh, the elimination rounds. And then today, earlier today, in Nigeria's 88-74 to loss to Team USA, she dropped 17 points and pulled down seven rebounds. She had a phenomenal Olympics. It was so cool to see. And you have to think to an extent, too, this might have opened up. A, I know that there aren't a ton of WNBA teams and there aren't a ton of roster spots, but this might have gotten her an opportunity to to take a to take a flight back to the states and maybe play some basketball back here in the U.S. Yeah, and I think that just anytime you get an opportunity to play on the national stage, international stage like that, it's obviously a big deal. And for her to compete to compete so well against really good teams, and, and you know, like you said, they pulled off some major upsets here. Just getting mm -hmm. to this point was a big deal. Um, Team USA is is overwhelming. Um, but they certainly acquitted themselves well. And I'd be remiss if we didn't also mention uh, Tommy Tywell, who yes. uh, and that butchered, butchered, I'm sure, pronunciation there, but uh, spent a, a grad a grad season with TCU um, in 2023, uh, 
so also a part of the team. Um, but but Amy, I think, is a, is a name that many TCU fans are familiar with, and and um, you know not only a great player but a great ambassador for TCU. Um, spent some time, I think, as a, as a grad assistant too, if I remember correctly, um, on uh, Reagan uh, Peebly's staff. So. Um, I think that she absolutely deserves an opportunity to get uh, an invite to WNBA camp. Um, obviously, it won't be for this season, but I think that I would not be surprised to see her, um, you know, on a on a preseason roster um, next spring with an opportunity, hopefully, to to earn some PT in one of those clubs. And with expansion, there's going to be a couple new teams next year. There certainly could be an opportunity for her. Yeah, that's the cool thing that's happening with women's hoops right now is that it's almost forcing the WNBA's hand when it comes to expansion because there mm-hmm. are simply not enough roster spots at the professional level for all of these talented women. And we saw this year, and I mean, as, as someone who's been keeping up a little bit more with the Dallas Wings the last several seasons, mm-hmm. the Wings had, I think, four first-round picks or four picks in the first 15, 16 yeah. last season, and only one of those four players is still on the roster right now. Yeah. So the the – the pool of talent is getting much bigger than there are opportunities for uh, those players to play in the WNBA. Uh, bottom which... out for Beckers. Uh, just at Dallas. Oh my bottom gosh. For yes. Beckers. Like that's, I'm, I'm hoping they're terrible down the stretch because Please. if you bring Paige Beckers to Dallas, I will oh, pass out. I would, honestly, probably call it. The, call, our the, friend Colin would pass out. Colin Post would pass out. Colin Post would move back to Fort Worth. In. In a heartbeat, he would quit his job and be here. He'd be like the little roadrunner. Like, you'd just see his legs spinning in place, and then he'd fire off the screen. (laughs) Um, Yes, Colin Post, if if Paige Buchers gets gets back here. Beckers? Paige Beckers, if she's drafted by the Wings, uh, you got a couch to sleep on, buddy. But... um, Yeah, no, I think I think it's really cool to see that the growth of the game at the collegiate level and now in the international scene is pushing the WNBA to um, grow. Because the reality is, is that if they want to uh, thrive and have success, that the you know the more the merrier, really at this yeah. point. Because yeah, I think a, a lot of women are proving that they're capable of playing at that level. Um, and we've seen what expansion has done for the men's league yeah. on both NBA, NFL, NHL, MLB, right? All of those leagues have expanded in the past, uh, and and we see see really good parity across most of those leagues because of it. So yeah, uh, well, excited, excited for that. And uh, but really, kind of back to the original point there, just really pumped for for Amy and for for the way she played this these past couple of weeks in, in Paris because it was cool to see. Well, I, tw- I tweeted out a, um, a video from TikTok. Um, Coach Jackie J on TikTok covers a lot of women's sports in a really interesting way. And she told the story of what the Nigerian athletes have gone through just to get to the Olympics and how absolutely mm-hmm. incredible it is to see them be successful because of how little support, not and not just women's basketball, but the, but the entire um, Olympic contingent. They've gotten so little support, both financially and otherwise. Um, they had a I think a, a a racer who wasn't entered in her race and was disqualified. I mean, it's just it's been a disaster. Yeah. Federations, Olympic Federations, disaster. So super happy for Amy to overcome all of those things, and um, I hope hope she just like we saw with um, with South Sudan on the men's side, um, bringing light to um, countries that aren't necessarily known for their basketball prowess and showing that there are literally incredible athletes all across the world. Um, and that everybody deserves an opportunity to play and have the resources to play. I think that's really cool. Um, but you talk about people taking advantage of their um, opportunities on the national stage. Um, we, of course, need to talk about the only college basketball player to play mm-hmm. on any of the three on three, three X three or five on five teams. And that was TCU's own Haley Van Lith. TCU's own bronze medalist, Olympic medalist, Haley Van yes. Lith. Um, there is not enough we can say about what like this can do for TCU athletics and TCU women's basketball for, for mm-hmm. Haley who became really the face of that program um, in a lot of ways and um, was their leading scorer through most of the Olympics um, was probably their most consistent player through most of the Olympics as well um, for her to show up and show out, even though the team struggled a little bit at the beginning um, she consistently uh, was a bright spot in those early games. And three-on-three is such a chemistry-based game and style. It took them a long time to come together. They lost Cameron Brink, who tore her ACL playing for the LA Sparks, um, mm-hmm. and they had to replace her on the fly. So there was a lot of reasons it took them a while to get going. Um, but if you watched um, the knockout rounds, I was so impressed with, with Team USA's effort and just so impressed with Haley. And, and I... Um, you know, I tweeted about how I just think that that style of basketball is going to do wonders, A, for her conditioning. Um, I, I think it was Kelsey Plum said that when she was playing, she played three-on-three three to get ready for five-on-five five because the, your conditioning has to be so elite. 
um, yeah. her court vision, uh, her toughness, you know, her, her ability to, to think and react. I mean, she's already such a smart, high IQ player. I think that that experience is going to do um, just wonders in elevating her game and getting her back to the type of player that we saw at Louisville before Ken Mulkey tried to ruin her and take all of her fun out of basketball. So uh, she's yeah. going to come back um, and, and be, I just think, instantly a leader. Um, I think her competitive fire is going to line up really, really well with people like Madison Connor, Sedona Prince. Um, and, and I think that she has a chance to um, even make a bigger impact uh, on TC women's basketball than we initially thought, just based on what we saw her do over the last couple of weeks in Paris. And just how freaking cool. How yeah. freaking cool for her. And I cannot wait till she gets back and they set up the media availability and she comes in wearing that Olympic medal. I've never seen one in person. Um, and I'm hoping that she's going to be like, oh, do you want to try it on? And I'm be like, oh, no, Haley, I'm a professional journalist. Oh, if you insist. Okay. <laughs> so, if, if, you know, if you see a selfie of me with Olympic medal at some point, just know that I've completely pre-planned and pre-ordained this all to happen. Nice. Uh, well, Haley, if you're listening, Melissa's hoping to, to wear yes. that bronze medal. Um, just please, or hold it. Even just hold it. I just want to Just look it, at it. Just honest. get real close to it. Um, yeah. yeah, no, very excited to see her thrive. I know that it was a challenging start to the three-on-three women's team and the men's team. Uh, yeah. They, they, they had struggled, a challenging both struggled too. mightily. Um, yeah. Starting 0-3 for the women uh, in pool play before rattling off five straight wins just to have some semblance of an opportunity. Um, losing in the semifinal game to the eventual silver medal team in Spain uh, before beating Canada in that bronze medal game. It was really cool to see them kind of persevere. Uh, it looked like... But like you mentioned, losing Cameron Brink really messed up the the chemistry of that team for a minute there. Um, but it was it was cool to see them kind of pull it up, pull it all together uh, and, and come away with the medal, even though it wasn't the one they probably wanted. Um, yeah, but still, so like cool none of see. us are ever so cool winning an Olympic medal, so yeah. we're just super happy oh, for percent. Haley. And mm -hmm. yeah, I just I can't like I said I can't I just I have been so fired up for the CC women's basketball season. I don't want to yeah. say it was a main motivator in me moving back to Fort Worth, um, but it's certainly in the top twenty five. Um, and I just think that the, this team has a chance to be really special, um, not just because of the talent, but when you look at the leadership and just playing on that stage and that level of gravity, I just, I think Haley has a chance to really um, galvanize this unit, even as a first year Horn Frog, and it, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, a thousand percent. Two more Horn Frogs that we're going to touch on here about uh, Olympic play before we move on to fall camp stuff, and that is the beach ball, beach volleyball duo of Danny Alvarez and uh, Tanya Moreno, they played for Spain. They really shot the moon uh, yeah. in their pool play and made it to the elimination round before falling in the quarterfinals uh, to one of the better teams in the world. Um, and just such a fun run for the two of them. Yeah. Really, really just outperformed, I think, everybody's expectations. Hector Gutierrez, the beach volleyball coach, got to go out to Paris and watch them play. Uh, so he was he was there supporting them and, and enjoying that. Similarly, Mark Campbell, the women's basketball coach for TCU, was in Paris a couple weeks ago uh, and, and last week watching Haley and all of his former players. He had nine former players and Haley participating yeah. in this Olympics. Uh, so pretty crazy for Mark Campbell to be able to brag about that. But it was cool to see the TCU coaches go out there and, and support their players and uh, just really kind of paint Paris purple a little bit. It was, it was kind of fun to see. Yeah, I, you know, it's any time, again, that you, you have a spotlight shined on you in a positive way um, as a university, I think that's cool. And um, I don't think we need to do a lot of convincing to get people to want to support mm -hmm. you beach volleyball with their predominantly male audience. Um, but uh, if you <laughs> needed a reason, then um, a couple of Olympians who, like you said, uh, just really outperformed any expectations that were placed on them. Um, and they're just getting started. I, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, potentially beach volleyball. I think they're not even really in their primes for that sport yet. So yeah. um, super cool, super exciting. Um, it, you know, I think we all can get behind um, rooting for USA. I don't think anyone's ever more patriotic than they are during the two weeks of the Olympics, right? Um, but it was also really cool to be able to root for some Horn Frogs um, across some other events um, and, and watch them have success and, and celebrate and, and see the TC social media uh, teams really get behind them and pump that up. Just super, super cool stuff. Um, a lot of fun. And we're just, I think it goes without saying, we're just both incredibly proud of the way those, um, mm -hmm. those young men and women um, across all of the sports, I think there were nine total in Paris um, that our, our TC alum or, or current TC students um, represented the Horn Frogs both on and off the court and just the, the class and the grace and the competitiveness they've shown. It's just, um, it's a great thing for TCU. It's a great thing for TCU and we're, and we're just fired up for all of their success and, and the fact that they had the opportunity to compete. Pretty freaking cool. Most uh, Horn Frogs ever in a single Olympics. 
Yeah. So Amazing. pretty dope. Uh, Melissa, let's move on to what everybody got here to, to listen to and, and maybe has fast forwarded through uh, to this point. So let's sit and talk yeah. about fall camp. We are seven practices in. You and I have been out there for the majority of them. Had yeah. opportunities to talk to Sonny, had opportunities to talk to Kendall Bryles and Andy Avalos, talk to a, a good amount of players, uh, other folks around the program as well. Um, when you think about where this team is right now, seven practices into fall camp, do you feel better or not as good about this upcoming season as you did two weeks ago when we did our last episode where we picked everybody in the Big 12? Uh, I mean, I think better, and I think part of that is just being here and going to practices and seeing just the energy, the enthusiasm. Like, everybody looks good in shells, right? Like, everybody mm -hmm. looks good in shorts and, and shirts. Um, but – and I wasn't at fall camp at all a year ago. So it's, it's hard for me. I can't compare those. You can. Um, but I definitely feel there's some very obvious leadership. Um, you know, you and I kind of, the first first practice I went out to last week, and you and I you kind of made a little, little you know, tap to me and said, you know, look, look pointing at Kaz Kazadi and, and just how engaged and how fired up he was in a way that I think a lot of people wanted to see a season ago. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hate to overuse locked in, but – you can see just just the locked inness of this team from the 450 coaches on staff um, to the you know 110 players or whatever it is. Um, it, it seems like um, everybody looks good. They're relatively healthy, which is cool. Yeah. We'll talk about a couple of big injuries um, on the defensive side, um, but but it it feels like you want it to feel heading into the second week of fall camp. Um, everything looks the part. Um, I'm not going to make any assumptions about how this team will perform until August 30th, but I really like what I'm seeing. I love the, the energy of guys like Bud Clark and Jack Fesh, who everyone knows I'm in love with, which is fine. He said hi to me today. I was really excited. Um, you know, I, I think that, that Hoover looks great. Um, he looks like he's moving super, super well. I love the the buzz that Haas Haney brings when he steps onto the field. Um, I've been super um, just pleasantly surprised by by uh, Ken Seals and the zip that he's got on his ball and the reads that he's making. I mean, it, it feels like the seven and a half, you know, over under feels right, um, but it doesn't feel like the over is out of reach by any stretch of the imagination. I would agree with that. I think for me uh, and – I say this not as a slight against anybody uh, who has coached here in the past. I really don't. No, just um, talk. Just, just say it. We but, know. We all know what you mean. <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed seeing so far through the first week of fall camp is how much this defense is working on tackling. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, you. You see every single day for multiple periods a day different group defensive groups are going through tackling drills. And that is something that as someone who was out at fall camp a lot last year was largely absent. Mm -hmm. And we saw 15 missed tackles in the first game against Colorado. The missed tackles never really stopped last year at all. Yeah. And it was a huge problem for this defense. And it's one of the reasons Sonny Dykes decided to make a change at defensive coordinator. So to see the defense working on some fundamentals like that, I think is really nice. Uh, and then Andy Avalos talked about it today when we had an opportunity to see him uh, in the media room after practice. He said, you know, at the end of the day, you can talk about scheme, you can talk about complexities and this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, it's tackle football. And you've got to make your right reads, you've got to get to the ball, you've got to make your tackles. And I think that that's really, truly, at its simplest form, what this defense needs to be about this year is making sure that they're making sound reads and that they're getting to the ball and they're making good tackles. And we've seen that through the first seven fall camp practices so far. Uh, a lot of different looks, a lot of four-man front, a lot of flying to the football. Um, that doesn't mean that the offense hasn't had success because they have had success. But I've just really been impressed with the energy and the physicality of the defense through the first seven practices. I think that's probably what's, what stood out to me a lot. Well, and I think kind of building off of that, I've been really impressed with the energy of Andy Avalos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, that you know, like you mentioned, we talked to him today um, on Wednesday when we we're recording this. Um, we got to talk to him and Kendall Bryles. And um, the way I can see why guys like playing for him, right? Like, I'm sure he is a hard you-know-what um, and he can get on mm -hmm. guys. And, you know, there's, there's a reason he came in with a little bit of a reputation. But um, he's so hands-on. 
like literally hands on in these drills. Um, I've seen some really unique drills that I hadn't seen before. Um, but I, I just I see him literally with his nose in the middle of things, getting involved, getting eye level with kids and really, really focusing on the small things, the details without losing sight of the big picture. So um, yeah, again, I can't compare it um, to, to Joe Gillespie style. I never got to see him in camp. I saw a couple practices during, um, you know, the playoff run. But um, I like a lot of what I'm seeing. Like, I don't want to say, like, compare it to Gary Patterson's, but it, it feels like the attention to detail and the minutia is very similar to that. And we saw how that could be lead to a lot of success on the defensive side of the ball. So, um, I mean, the vibes seem good, mm-hmm. right? We'll see how that translates. Um, and there's a lot of questions to answer when, when – you know, we start going 11 on 11, but yeah, I think you're absolutely yeah. right. I think you're, we're seeing them focus on the things that were real weaknesses last year in week two of practice and week one of practice. And hopefully it, it helps kind of set the foundation for actual gameplay. I think so. I think it will. And um, I, I just, I, I, I'll be interested to see how the depth chart shakes out because I think that mm-hmm. there are still some question marks there. Uh, defensive line seems pretty set, especially on the interior. Tymon Mitchell has had a phenomenal fall camp. Mm-hmm. He's been incredibly disruptive along the offensive line. Uh, his partner in crime in the interior, Caleb Fox, has also done well sliding back in to the interior after spending last season mostly at the edge position. Um, and you've got a guy who is a grad transfer in from Notre Dame in Nana Osafa Mensa, mm-hmm. who has been a real anchor for the edge position on this defensive line not to mention Devin Deal who had 12 sacks last year uh at Tulane on the other end as well I I, I love the defensive line depth you get Cooper McDonald in here from San Diego State as well who Andy Avalos spoke very highly of today Mm -hmm. uh and I I like the depth there at defensive line you move back at linebacker as well and I mean you're talking about three guys that have all conference potential and Johnny Hodges Namdi Obi Azor and Caleb Elarms Orr who transferred in from Cal picking TCU over Ohio State. So big get in the transfer portal portal for the Frogs there. And all three of those guys have been ball hawks all fall so far. They've, they've looked incredibly good. They're all healthy, which wasn't the case in the spring. Uh, and it's been nice to see them moving around a little bit. The questions start to come at cornerback, where mm-hmm. you've lost Avery Helm, you've lost Vernon Glover. We're not sure for how long yet. Um, Sonny was a, va- a little bit vague in his update about both of their injuries earlier this week. Uh, but they both did go down with injuries over the weekend. And so now you're dipping into the depths of that cornerback room. You've got JT Broughton, who transferred in from Utah. You've got Lamarian James, who transferred in from Old Dominion. Uh, and, he's uh, a beast in NCAA. He's, he looks great. Oh, he's yeah. No, those, they're the, the two game. best defensive players outside of Marcus yeah. Steele. They're the two best defensive players on TCU's team uh, in, in the video game. Um, you got a kid Which is from very Austin akin P. to real life. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And you've got Austin P as well. A kid from Austin P in uh, who's, who's played a lot of corner in his career, who has looked pretty good. There is depth of that position. Uh, and then the safeties. I mean, I think I'm really excited about the safety group as well Super with Bud, safeties, yeah. Jamel Johnson, um, <clears throat> Abe Kamara has had a great fall so far. Uh, the Memphis transfer Cam Smith has had a great, Cam great fall great. so far. Yeah. Uh, I, I really like the talent on this defense and it seems to me, that the way Avalos is coaching this defense up, the things that he's asking them to do are more aligned with their skill sets and their abilities than we saw last year on the defense. So yeah, uh, square I, I think, pegs and square holes. Right? Yes. Like, and uh, yeah. So I think that, I think we're going to see uh, an improved defense this year. He, he stressed today. Avalos did that. The, the first goal is always to stop the run. Um, and, you know, there have been team practices where it's been really hard for the offense to run the football. Yeah. You know, that's, we don't know everything about what that says about the team so far um, because we know that this team's got some pretty good running backs in that room. But uh, it's, it's been good to see from a defensive perspective, the energy, the tackling, uh, and kind of the, just the change of pace overall uh, from the coaching on that side of things. Well, and just the physicality too, you know, like they were doing mm-hmm. one-on-ones and Lamarian James got matched up with Savion Williams and man, we get to the offense, Savion, dude, that dude just, he, he looks yes. like he yes. has a chance to legitimately be a first round prospect. Like he just, mm-hmm. everything. And, and Lamarian James is not nearly as wide or as tall as Savion and they got real physical on, on kind of a little fade route to the end zone. And Savion won the battle, but Lamarian was wearing those little like pads. So yeah. he couldn't really hand fight him, but. It was, it was really impressive to see him try to match him, to be physical with him. He wasn't afraid, um, and, and he scrapped with him all the way to, to the ground. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Savion got up and, and talked a little bit. Lamarian was like, I've got gloves on. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. 
Um, but but it's it's cool to see that physicality, see how competitive those two units are against each other. And you know, Kendall Bryle said that, that he's not really competing against Andy Avalos' defense, but um, it's good for them to play a physical, aggressive defense because that, that's what they're going to be seeing, you know, week in and week out in the Big Twelve. So. Um, I think the early returns are very, very positive. Again, it's going to have to translate into to actual gameplay, but there's a lot of reason mm-hmm. to have hope that they'll be able to execute um, the game plan. And, and Andy did talk about, I mean, their, their install, he said they were 93 to 95%, but he said 95 to 93, and he, he does numbers backwards. It it's made, fine. My, it made um, my brain go fuzzy I for was a hurting. second. Yeah, <laughs> um, but, but he's, I think he's been really impressed with the IQ of this team and how quickly they've been able to, to grasp mm-hmm. things and implement them, which is a great sign when you're only seven practices in with a, with a yeah. new system, even though they had a lot of those guys were here for the spring. And, you know, new NCAA rules allow you to have summer OTAs, essentially. And mm-hmm. so he talked about both coaches, uh, both coordinators talked about that on Wednesday. Yeah. was how they took advantage of that time in June where you have more time once your roster is more solidified to get out with guys and talk about playbook and, and start to install some things. Uh, I think that that was a really helpful time uh, as well for both of those coordinators yeah. to get some of the newer faces um, more up to speed. Uh, but yeah, Melissa, on the other side of the football, I think that there are some really positive notes in the first seven practices as well. The, the main one being Josh Hoover is back and looks completely yeah. healthy uh, and has been making, for the most part, some really smart decisions with the football uh, through these team uh, periods for the first first seven practices. Yeah, and, and you know, I was talking to, to Jeremy Clark, and, and he had talked about how he mentioned that, that Hoover wasn't being real flashy, and some people took that as a negative, but him and I both mm-hmm. agree that Josh Hoover is not Trayvon Boykin, nor should he try to be, right? Correct. And Correct. what he is doing, I think, is going through his progressions, making reads, and then picking the right, the first correct read. Um, mm-hmm. I want to see them throw the ball downfield. I think it's super important to have those explosive elements and with the wide receivers that he has to work with. I think there will be opportunities to make big plays, but first and foremost, I want to see TC matriculate the ball down the field. I want to see him make good decisions in the red zone. I want to see them convert red zone opportunities into points because that was a huge struggle. And, and for a kid that does not have a full season of starting under his belt, completing, you know, 67, 68% of his passes, having a three to one TD to interception ratio um, and, and being able to convert you know, the, that second goal from the eight, I, I think is way more important than being able to, you know, drop a 55 yard bomb to a stre- streaking, you know, Braylon uh, James down the field or something. So um, I, I think that, that he, his maturity and his decision making are his two best skill sets. And we're mm-hmm. seeing him execute that at a really high level so far in camp. Yeah, I was talking to one, uh, one person kind of close to the team uh, of earlier today, and he said that the challenge for Josh Hoover will always be fearlessness versus efficiency. Hmm. And I really liked the framework on that statement because uh, I think we saw it too last year, and we've seen it in fall camp here and there, not as much. Um, he's got this little kind of gunslinger attitude, this gunslinger mm-hmm. mentality where he – feels confident in every single throw that he can make. And he feels like he can make it at any given time, even if it's not necessarily the smart or right decision in that moment. Um, we saw that on Wednesday morning in the first team drill where he had, you know, probably, I think it was sitting around second and seven and he had probably five or six free yards right there in front of him. He had already rolled out to the right. You can, you can go take those five, six yards, get to a third and short and get the first down and keep rolling threw it back across the middle of the field. Uh, ball got tipped up in the air, wasn't intercepted, but now you're looking at a third and seven when you really had a third and two yeah, right in your grasp. So yeah. some, some, some things like that still, you know, hey, like let's just let's be efficient. Let's make sure that we're taking what we're given. Uh, and there will be times to be fearless and be a gunslinger as well. But the reality is for this offense, efficiency has to be the name of the game this year after how bad they were, especially in the red zone last season. Um, and well, that, starts, it- that starts with Josh Huber. And I think part of that, too, is that where people are going to question is when he does have that opportunity to take off and run for a couple of quick yards, especially in the non-contact portion of camp, like, is that part of that still the fear of, of getting hurt? And you wonder mm-hmm. if he needs, you know, if the, after that first time he gets hit, Stanford, and he, bounce, he manages to bounce back up, if maybe some of that will do it. Because he, he wasn't asked to run. And, and frankly, I think everyone was afraid of him running because of the depth behind him or lack thereof. But 
I think this year there's enough quarterback depth to where not to put him at risk and not to ask him to, you know, to be Hoss Haney out there, but mm -hmm. to where he can take those runs, slide down, avoid taking a big hit, but, but pick up four or five when the opportunity presents himself. He's going to have to do that in order to keep defensive honest. And also because the offensive line is still a little bit of a work in progress. And there might be times that he is running for yards. There might be times he's running for his life. Yeah, and that's that's a really nice segue into this next little position group here, talking about the offensive You're line welcome. because oh gosh, we're <laughs> right back in the flow of things. Uh, Sonny did talk on Monday night after practice about the battle that is starting to grow between James Brockermeyer and Colton Deary at that center position. Um, it's been fun to watch them both. Colton Deary came into fall camp as the number one center. He was working mostly with the first team, got sick, missed a couple of practices, and Brockermeyer took his place. And really played pretty well. Sonny said, mm -hmm. uh, I believe the quote was, we didn't notice Colton was gone, which probably doesn't make Colton Deary feel very no, good, but yeah. it's got to make TCU fans feel like, hey, we actually have some depth along this line. Yeah. That's that's an improvement over what we saw at times in 2023. Um, and so those guys, since Deary has come back, have been really kind of rotating, each taking uh, turns, running with the ones and twos. Um, it would not be surprising to see both of those guys start on the, law, on the line at some capacity because they both have versatility and can play those guard positions as well. And when you think about the guard spot right now, I think that's probably the biggest question mark for TCU is left guard because you brought Cade Bennett in from San Diego State. He's going to be out for the year with a disc issue in his back. He's having surgery to take care of that issue, and he'll have two years of eligibility left after that. Um, so he has an opportunity to be a, a stalwart on this offensive line in the future. But now TCU is already moving on to their backup plan at left guard. And right now that's been Remington Strickland, the Texas A&M transfer that's come in. Uh, he's been getting the majority, if not all, of the first team reps at left guard, left guard with Cooper Powers taking most of the second string reps there. Uh, I'll be honest, Strickland has looked fine at times. He's also had some missteps at times as well. Um, and so I think that there might be an opportunity for whoever doesn't win that center battle to maybe slide over to left guard uh, and, and be the starting left guard there. I think the tackle positions uh, with Mike Nichols at right tackle and Bless Harris at left, they've both looked incredibly good through, for, through seven uh, fall camps, um, fall practices. Uh, and we did see... Sonny, Sonny jinxed himself on Monday. He said they only had five false starts in the first six fall camps. Uh, we did see a false start today. We saw the sixth one, but big one, yeah. It was it was a guard. It wasn't a tackle. So, um, you know, the tackle position uh, seems to be pretty solid right now. Obviously, health can change things in a heartbeat. Yeah. But uh, the offensive line is still, I think, a work in progress. But I have seen some really good growth in that area. Well, and it's, you know, I think when you com almost completely rebuild your line on the fly and you do it with a bunch of transfers, I mean, there's not a position group in football that relies more on chemistry than that unit. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take time for it to come together. But when you look at it, I think the floor is is relatively high with this group and the ceiling, I think, can also be relatively high. The talent is there. I mean, there are a lot of guys on that line that were very highly recruited. There are are a lot of guys with a lot of experience if they can stay healthy they have a chance to be really really solid and potentially pretty damn good um mm -hmm. but it's going to be developing the the depth behind it which like you mentioned is already being tested so i think the pieces are there i think that um I, i've been really impressed with the way that aj ricker is coaching them up i watched a lot of offensive line this morning um just because i was i was curious what that was going to look like and what they were doing and um he again is another guy who seems super locked in and engaged this year and he's got something to prove too that you know, he's got to be able to not just take these these different pieces from all of these different places and mold them into one cohesive unit, but he's got a lot of young talent behind them that he's got to show to develop and hopefully not develop to play, but develop for the future because you do not mm -hmm. want to be in the habit of needing to get three or four guys to start out of the transfer portal every season. And that's basically what he's had to do the last couple of years. So um, hopefully the recruiting depth starts to pay dividends a year from now, but I think that we're seeing when you look at them, they're, they are very big. They are all very nasty. They play with a mean streak. That's been mentioned by multiple coaches and players. Um, they, they are not afraid to, to scuffle it up a little bit. They're getting good challenge now from the defensive line as well, which I think will be helpful. Um, but, yeah, at the end of the day, it's going to be about being able to execute and, and being able to play like one cohesive unit. And that's going to be so critically important for TC to be successful, especially when we talk about the red zone and the running game, which was a huge issue for the Horned Frogs last year as well. It was, you know, there wasn't a, a guy in that room last year that really had breakaway speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I loved Imani Bailey. I think his first cut was one of the best we've seen Brilliant. at TCU. 
Um, but the top end speed wasn't quite there like it was uh, with Kendra Miller or with Amari Di Mercado uh, or Zach Evans when he was here for the year he was here, two years he was here, whatever. Um, and so it, it's it's nice to have seen now firsthand what Cam Cook is capable of um, because he has had some Im- really impressive runs yeah. uh, so far this, this fall. Uh, I believe the phrase that Kendall Pryles used on Wednesday was he – gets the dirty yards. Yeah, um, the dirty yards. Uh, which I didn't know there were dirty and clean yards. That shows my ignorance, I guess. But uh, it, 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 he, he made the point, and I think you posted it on the, on the Instagram account. I've got it clipped for, for TikTok as well. Um, just talking about all of the different ways that Cam Cook can get yards and, and be explosive for this team, but how he was most impressed with how mature of a runner he is. He waits for the game to come to him. He's not trying to force anything. Uh, but he can make anything happen at any given moment once he sees the opportunity. Uh, so that's uh, I, I'm very excited to see Cam Cook run this year. I think based on the way Kendall was talking about him on Wednesday, it seems like Cam Cook is pretty much the front runner to be the yeah. lead back on this thing. And then you've got Trey Sanders coming back. You've got Trent Battle coming dead. back. You've got two two really impressive freshmen in Jeremy Payne and uh, Nate Palmer who are uh, – on the roster and then you just got Arkansas transfer Dominic Johnson in as well. So that's a loaded room. Um, I, I think it's a really talented room and uh, it, it'll be fun to see how, how this offensive line blocks up for these running backs to, to yeah. get them involved. And it'll also be fun to see how this offensive line blocks up to get Josh Hoover time to throw to, like you said earlier, every uh, just the, the wildly talented wide receivers and tight ends on this roster. Yeah, you know, one of the things I asked Kendall Bryles about today was how do, how do you keep a group that's that deep engaged and then, you know, also figure out how to use all of them. And he said it's been no issue keeping them engaged, that this group is all pretty locked in, um, that they, they love to compete, they love to play, they all want the ball, they all always think they're open because they're wide receivers and that's just the name of the game, um, which got a nice little laugh out of the room, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, when you've got a guy like Savion Williams, who is six foot three, who, um, you know, Malcolm Kelly told us they'd clocked him at 22 miles per hour, mm-hmm. um, which is like, he's got the second or third fastest time, um, of all TCU receivers of the modern era, just behind Darius Davis, which is a feat Insane. in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so the fact that he's as big as if he's, the dude's just massive. I mean, you, you could put him on the D line. You could put him at linebacker and nobody would blink twice if he was suited up in, you know, in a, in a 97 number. I think everybody like, oh yeah, he's a D line. I mean, he's just huge. And the yeah. fact that he moves the way that he does. Um, I, I think that his hands, um, are really underrated. Um, just watching him make some plays in those one-on-ones. Um, he, he's, he really understands how to use his body and, and get his hands out to the ball. Um, mm-hmm. so he's special. I think, I think JP Richardson, um, you know, is such an excellent route runner, runner and someone that Josh Hoover has so much confidence in. Um, that that's the guy you're gonna, you're gonna go to in a big spot and expect him to make plays. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, when you look at, at Drake Dabney and what he's able to do, and, and he kind of looks a little bit like a maybe a little bit faster Jared Wiley, um, and, and his ability um, uh, to to separate and, and to create space. And I think Jack Fesh really could be the X factor um, mm-hmm. of that group because his at his size and strength, his ability to run, and also just again be a really tight route runner. Uh, there are a lot of places that Josh Hoover can go with the ball. We, I mean, I haven't even gotten to um, to Braylon and Eric McAllister and uh, Dalen Wright um, and um, shoot. I mean, Chase Curtis is out there finally, looks healthy and looks looks good. Lafayette Coway, you know, if he's he's finally mm-hmm. coming back into practice. Between the tight ends and the wide receivers, there is no dearth of, of talent. There's only one football. Um, but if you can keep these guys on the same page and can, can keep them competing, but also supporting each other, I mean, there's there are a lot of places to go with football and there's a lot of different formations you can throw out there in order to keep defenses on their toes. Not to mention Jordan Bailey and major Everhart oh, and Joe yeah. Earl and freshman Dozie Azukanma who put a guy on absolute skates in one of yeah. today, absolutely <laughs> obliterated this guy's ankles. Uh, not really the cornerback is healthy, but it was a beautiful move off of the line by Dozie yeah. to get wide open it for a, a goal line fade. You're right. The the talent at wide receiver is so impressive. Um, The challenge will be distribution because Browse did say today there's only one football. And while they all might be engaged now, they all might be engaged in fall camp while they're fighting for a spot when the depth chart comes out and when things maybe, you know, everybody, like he also said, you talk to any of these wide receivers, they're going to tell you they're always open. And uh, we'll see, we'll see how, uh, how it goes. We'll see what 
uh, what receivers kind of rise to the top as far as trust factor with Josh Hoover, which is so critically important. Um, but right now here on August 7th, as we're recording this, it's a good problem to have yeah. for TCU football to have this many talented guys trying to catch the football for your team. Um, Melissa, was there anything today that stood out to you uh, from Kendall and Andy in their media availabilities? I know that they both got asked about the new communication systems that are being implemented at college this year. They both said that they would be the communicators for their various sides of the football. I thought that was interesting. Kendall mentioned that all of the equipment was so big, he might need to get a utility belt. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things that I thought was interesting from Andy Avalos was how he's he, he talked about the, the potential downside of, of these new comms systems where you know, the cutoff is at 15 seconds. What is that going to do for an offense? Are they going to try to go fast? Are they going to try to slow play you to show the formation? And so he said he was, he's been really intentional this fall about continuing to install signals and make sure that the kind of more traditional ways of communicating with your team from the sideline uh, are still up to snuff and up to speed because you can't be fully reliant on on the headset and the, and the walkie-talkie. Um, to, to make sure that your team is where they need to be. I thought it was also interesting that he mentioned that he's talked to a lot of NFL guys who have come back to the college game to see what that adjustment is like and what that system is like, because it is new for the collegiate game, but the NFL has been using it for a really long time. And so being able to, you know, he, like you said, that keeping the old ways in, what he said is you don't want to become overly reliant on the comm system. And also like, you know, this from watching TCU baseball, like don't ever rely on the comm system, right? Yeah, <laughs> because shoot, it's no always going to fail you at the Curtis burn. And um, uh, I just think yeah. it's because they got sweaty heads. They got to figure yeah, out a better be, way to, Carson better way to and Curtis Vern can tell mm -hmm. you stories, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting. And, and, you know, on the flip side of that, Kendall Bryles was asked about it and if it would slow him down. And I think that, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation about this TCU offense play too fast. Um, you know, it's, it's great if you run 90 plays, but not if you can't convert, you know, a third, third down or a goal line situation or a red zone situation. And so he did talk about how that what this might enable them to do is, is vary their tempo. He said, we're still going to play fast. We're still going to be the team that, that we've been, but there will be opportunities where we slow it down and try to mm -hmm. give the defense a, a different look after that 15 seconds and try to see if they can adjust on the fly. And so um, I, I don't think there are many TC fans that would complain if TC ran a few less plays. Um, so if, even if it's a difference of, you know, five to eight a game, that's a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about the overall pace of the game and, and being able to get your signals in, but, you know, especially when you look at, you know, a, a still relatively inexperienced starting quarterback, I think that communication system is going to make a big difference. And I, I do like that both coordinators will be the ones directly relaying that information into those headsets. And I do think that TCU has the right guys with the right football IQ on the field in order to be able to, to do that. And I think it'll be really fun, especially on defense, to see the players with the green dot kind of rise up and watch them lead and watch them kind of get be the coach on the field. I think that's always so fascinating in the NFL. So I'm excited to see what that translates to in the college game. Yeah, I'll be I'll be really excited to see who who has the green dot for sure. Mm -hmm. Just to I mean, obviously it'll be Hoover on the offensive side of things, but yeah. which linebacker gets it? My my gut says Namdi. Johnny. Um, oh, you think? But, okay, uh, yeah. yeah it'll, it'll be really Namdi, fun to yeah, see how. Namdi will how be the guy that. I think it's gonna be Namdi. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think we're going to see, well, I think we're going to see all three of those guys rotate, but I think, I think Namdi's going to be the one that sees the most snaps by the end of the year, but this isn't the bold predictions episode. So we're not going to get there quite yet. No, sure. Um, that's true. Yeah. Melissa, we've, we've we're going to have so many more updates from fall camp over the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks as the frogs get ready for the season ahead of that first game on August 31st against Stanford. But there's so much more news to get to still yeah. with what's gone on in the last couple of weeks. Probably the biggest piece of news when it comes to TCU football on the recruiting front is that they have a quarterback again for the 2020 class. We haven't we talked it. about this yet, but folks, if you want to go back in the little bit of the time machine here and go back a couple episodes ago when we were talking about Ty Hawkins and his decommitment, I mentioned a name. I mentioned a name. I said, oh, this is a guy that they will probably turn their attention to. Um... And I'm not going to take a victory lap here in this moment, Melissa, but Adam Schobel is the name that I said, and Adam Schobel is now committed to the 2025 TCU Horned Frogs football class. I want to give you your flowers, but I also want to remind you that his last name is Schobel. 
<laughs> so sure. I think, uh, hey, yeah, hey. I think a lot of people were looking, but yes, absolutely. Yes. You, well, you mentioned him and you also mentioned that I would be happy because it would be a quarterback that was taller than you, which is all mm -hmm. I've asked for for the last several years. And so, um, you were, you were very early on the Adam Schobel. Um, uh, can we, can we talk about the place that he was now that he's committed yes. that nobody talked about? So, so you, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, tell the story. No, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. I was going to say we, it was, it was the night of the uh, flying tea club, the NIL mm -hmm. uh, fundraiser event. You sent me a text and you were like, somebody interesting is at that event. And it was Adam Schobel sitting next to Kendall Bryles. And, and we were all taking bets on how soon it would be before that leaked amongst the TCU community. And nobody noticed, nobody said a word. Nobody tweeted. I didn't. I don't think it was on the board anywhere that I saw. I mean, it was radios, and I don't know if that was just TC fans getting it and realizing that the best thing to do would be to not say anything, or if literally nobody knew. But I think what, once you sent me that text that he was there, I started to feel really, really confident about. I started feeling confident when he followed me back on Twitter immediately. Like that's when I was like, oh, obviously yeah. a horn frog. Clearly, um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, it's listen. This is a big deal for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. And and I I'll, I I'll go through them and then and then you can tell me where I'm right or where I'm wrong here. But number one, um, we've heard so much about um, Kendall Bryles, the quarterback whisperer, right? And what a great recruiter he is. And you know he got Haas Haney to sign on late. He he got him to flip from Duke. Um, but to have invested so much time and effort and energy into Ty Hawkins, and which is the right thing to do, um, and then to lose Ty and to so quickly be able to pivot and bring home a legacy, someone that the fans were going to be really excited about, um, somebody that had TCU ties, but somebody that was committed to a really good situation for himself in Oklahoma State, um, and to be able to flip him and bring him home after losing somebody, do it within less than four weeks' time, I think is a really, really big deal. Um, I also feel very confident that Adam Trouble is going to sign on the dotted line. I don't think there's too much assumption into that. Like, I think that's, that's an all but a given. Um, but then also what he like, it's also a really good sign to me because Adam Schobel is not the typical prototypical Kendall Bryles quarterback. Um, and so it shows that, that Kendall Bryles recognizes that he needs to go out and get the best talent that he can and that hopefully he'll be willing to adapt his system around the talent that he gets because Adam Schobel is incredibly gifted that he's big. He's always strong. He, he moves well at his size, but this is not. You know, it's not a running quarterback. It's not this is polar opposite of Haas Haney in almost every way. Um, but if you're able to have both of those kids on the roster and, and put them in situations for both of them to be successful, you have two guys that could easily lead TCU to Big 12 championships in their careers. And, and will both of them play, you know, four or five years here? That remains to be seen. But I think both of them will at times see the field for the Horned Frogs and, and have a chance to be really, really exceptional quarterbacks and, and have an offense that's geared to their skill sets that is also can be really successful for TCU. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying there, and I agree with a lot of it. I think part of the pitch to Schobel from Bryles could have been Josh Hoover. You know, Josh mm -hmm. Hoover's also not the most mobile guy. He is he's he can move, he can run, and he's capable of it. We saw it a little bit last year, but I think the pitch could be, hey, we had a kid who hadn't seen live action hardly at all, who in six starts last year threw for four hundred yards twice and three hundred yeah. yards four times. And, it, you know, I mean, he was impactful with his legs here and there. But the reality of last year's offense was, hey, we're, we got to air it out um, because of the situations that they found themselves in often in games. You couldn't really afford to run to get back into it. You had to sling it around. And Josh Hoover was capable of doing it. And he was capable of doing it in a Kendall Bryles offense. So, mm -hmm. you know, you look at that film and you say, hey, that offense was putting up some pretty good numbers last year. They weren't terribly efficient. But the points were there for the most part. Um, I, I think that's a pretty good selling point for the kid. Not to mention, like you said, I, he's a showable. He's he, the last name is CCU royalty, and obviously, I was being a little bit tongue in cheek there with with the prediction. But uh, you know, no, I we're think, giving you all I the think, credit. Think, we went, no, no, we went, no. We went, we went all. I didn't. I didn't. Bile, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't put in a crystal ball for a reason. Um, but <laughs> uh, it was cool to see him at the flying tee thing, and I think more TCU fans recognized that he was there. Then they let on. There were a couple folks who were who were dropping some subtle hints on the board. Obviously, Jeremy and I were, were pretty tight lipped about it because, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the right time to to give that information out because of the, the context of where we saw him. But uh, it was it was cool to see him there. It was cool to see him there with his family. Um, and then he, you know, finished his official visit to TCU and, and committed to the Horn Frogs on Monday uh, following. So it, it was a nice, nice little turn of events. Um, 
TCU seems to have, you know, a, a really capable quarterback coming in for the 2025 class now. Yeah. And like you said, two legacies enter, right, yeah. with Haas and, and Adam now. Um, and it's going to be a real treat to see how the quarterback situation plays out in, in the next couple of years. But I think the reality truly is that, you know, this is Josh Hoover's ball club right now yeah. and it has the potential to be Josh Hoover's ball club for a couple more years after this one. So we'll see, we'll see how everything shakes out. Um, when we, when we get to that bridge, um, Melissa, that's not the only, only kid to commit for the Horn Frogs in the last few, um, weeks. They've gotten a, a couple other guys as well as I vamp to pull up the list. Blake Robinette, a flip from UNLV is one that happened uh, pretty quickly after Schobel announced mm -hmm. his commitment. Robinette, being from All Saints Episcopal, uh, got his TCU offer and pretty much committed right on the spot. I can't blame him for doing that. Twenty uh, third, he was the twenty third commit for the twenty twenty five class, uh, and is at a position of need. He's along the defensive line. Uh, really athletic kid. If you watch his film, he's not the biggest kid quite yet, uh, but he's got a good frame. You can add a lot of weight to it. And his first step off the snap is, I think, really impressive. Uh, he, he's strong and he can bull rush. And I think that that's a guy that you can really mold, especially if you're Andy Avalos and James McFarland into, um, sorry, Jamarcus McFarland into uh, a really powerful uh, defensive lineman there. So that's, that's pretty cool to see. Um, they do have... Another commitment that happened after that, and I'm trying to find it now by scrolling really quickly here. This always goes well when yeah, I'm you're doing a great job. You're this. oh, absolutely Baylor they they, fli they flipped another defensive lineman, Brady uh, Brody Watley, the Baylor kid, uh, who who flipped. Not anymore. It was so funny. It was so funny to see his picture on 24-7 because if you went to Brody Watley's profile when he was committed to Baylor, obviously it had like the green and gold bar that said he was committed. But his profile picture on 24-7 was him in a TCU letter jacket and a Carter Boys hat. And then he flipped. Love it. And now his picture is just like generic headshot. I think it's so <laughs> funny uh, that that is the change that happened. But Freddie Watley and Blake Robinette are two defensive linemen that are going to be a part of the 2025 class as well. As Sonny Dykes continues to make it a priority to build up the trenches on both sides of the football and get a... Um, critical mass of bodies in here to be able to put a, a, a winning product on the field in those areas, which I think is the but, right way to approach But they're also it. not ignoring the skill positions because their first 2026 commit mm -hmm. is a yes. speedy wide receiver, four-star uh, Brock Boyd, who uh, out of South Lake Carroll. So we know that they, the skill positions that come out of that school tend to be mm -hmm. pretty effective at the next level. His offer list, super, super impressive. Yes. Um, you know, Oregon, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, um, we won't mention the other two. We don't care about them, uh, but, but among, <laughs> among many, um, but, but another kid who is, um, an exceptional route runner, super polished, um, has a lot of speed. He's not super big. Um, he's got to add some weight for sure. He's, he's pretty, he's pretty thin so far. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, it, it just, a really good track athlete that doesn't just compete in the sprints, but the field events as well. Um, and, and a kid who, when you look at TC's wide receiver room and how stacked it is, a lot of those guys are entering their final year or, um, second to last year of eligibility. And so restocking while also elevating and, and developing the young guys that are, that are on, um, uh, this roster like, uh, Dozy and, uh, 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 Baker, uh, Kyle, and I always question it. Um, so if you got those two guys and you can start bringing in some talent behind them, you, you want to just like you want in every other position group, you want to be able to build stack talent and get guys that can get on the field young, but also guys that are developing behind them. And um, I, I think Boyd is one of those kids that has a chance to be super, super impactful um, pretty quickly when, once he's on campus. I agree. I agree. Uh, super excited about him. He's a guy that TC has been on for a long time. I remember him from the DFD, DFW showcase a couple years ago. Uh, and him already starting to stand out uh, in the crowd when that you know that weekend is so so huge for TCU recruiting and for so many schools because you have roughly two thousand kids that come through in two yeah. days worth of camps yeah, and incredible. tons of coaching staffs from all across the country come through for that uh, and he and he stood out in his session uh, pretty clearly from what I can I can recall so this is a, a really nice gift for TCU for the twenty sixth class uh, starts that thing off on a high note um, speaking of high notes Melissa. Uh, 
Thursday, the day that you, the listener, are most likely listening to this. I knew you were going to transition to this. <laughs> Melissa and I will be talking to two of the most interesting people we could possibly be talking mm -hmm. to. And that is the two newest former head coach, current TCU analysts, Dana Holgerson and Todd Graham, are being made available Crazy. to the media on Thursday. Gary would never. My body is ready. I am so excited. I, I, mine um, is not. I, I, still, I still just get a little for clamps every time I see Dana walking around the, the practice field. It's fun. It's cool. It's and so I'll say fun. this. like a year, uh, Shout out to um, Carter Yates, who Dave Campbell's Texas football's Carter Yates, college football writer, who's been out at practice this, this week watching the Horn Frogs. He's, he brought up a really interesting question in, in Sonny's press conference that um, – I liked that he that he brought it to the forefront, and that's the fact that last year in 2023, Sunny Dykes had no former head coaches on staff. This year, heading into mm -hmm. 2024, Sunny Dykes has four former head coaches on staff: Andy Avalos and Ken Wilson, defensive coordinator and linebacker coach, respectively. And now Dana Holgerson and Todd Graham. And in this day and age, when you have so much to do as a coaching staff and you have so many things to try and pay attention to. And Andy Avalos even said it on Wednesday, there's just not enough time when yeah. you talk about installing and, and, and getting ready for a specific defense or specific uh, opponents this year. There's just not enough time in the day having resources like Dana and Todd come in, provide their insight, do what they're doing, which is switching sides of the ball and Dana working with the defense and Todd working with the offense to poke holes in both of those schemes. Um, is going to be such a huge benefit, I think, to TCU this season because they just bring such a wealth of knowledge to the game. They don't have to do hands-on coaching. They don't have to worry about you know what the schedule for practice is going to be. They have a very specific task, and that's scout TCU right now and then scout opponents when the season starts. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't put a value, I don't think, on having that level of... Um, talent and that that amount of experience in the room helping Sonny out helping these coordinators out get get ready day in and day out once the season comes well and i think it says not just a lot about Sonny and the coordinators that are willing to have these head coaches come in and and kind of oversee them to some degree um it, it says a lot about just their desire to be the best versions of themselves and be the best for tcu football it also says a lot about you know, Dana Holgerson and, and Todd Graham, that they're willing to come in and, and humble themselves to a degree and fill this this role that, you know, is often filled by like a GA or, or a QC, you know, so mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't work for everybody. And, you know, we can we can both think of somebody immediately that it hasn't really worked for. It, it's a hard thing to do. And not every personality is is there for it. Um, you know, and I think that obviously Dana Holgerson and Sonny Dykes have, have a long standing um, friendship and relationship and have coached together previously. And so I'm sure there was some of that. But um, I could not be more excited to talk to them tomorrow. I'll be interested to see what their perspective is. I'm a little terrified to ask a Todd Graham a question, but I'm, I'm just going to practice the mirror a couple times tonight um, to make sure I don't say anything stupid. It can't be worse than, than trying to ask Gary a question at a press conference. That's my philosophy. No. If I can, if I can withstand Gary, I can, I can withstand anything. But, but it is, it is really, really cool. And it is, I mean. Listen, if you love college football, then, you know, it's, it's like Dana Holgerson, Mike Leach are kind of those two, two guys that you look at is, is those, those, and, and probably Mike Gundy, um, mm -hmm. those kind of dudes that are a little bit different and, and super likable that you want to go out and have a beer with. Um, yeah. and, and it's going to be, it's really fun to just see him in a purple shirt wandering around the practice field. It is, it is, it's crazy. And, uh, you know, had a chance to introduce myself the other day and, and just have a brief conversation with him and. Uh, talk, he talked about you know still adjusting and and trying to figure out you know where he's supposed to be and what his role really is and uh, but it, it is cool to to have that that wealth of knowledge on staff and I think it's going to benefit Sonny and, and the Horn Frogs in the long run for sure. Um, Absolutely, Melissa. Let's 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 do a couple quick hits here as we kind of wrap up this episode. Um, basketball schedules are starting to come out. We're getting some non conference cool, and exhibition cool, opponents cool. for both the men's and women's teams. Uh, let's start with. The men's team, because I think we're going to spend more time talking about women's hoops in this section. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamie Dixon has scheduled Arkansas for an exhibition game that will happen in November on November 1st uh, at Dickey's Arena. It will be open to the public. If you think about these exhibition games, typically for TCU in the past, they have been uh, 
not Arkansas level opponents. Yeah. Uh, Texas Wesleyan was the exhibition game last year. Paul Quinn was the exhibition game two years ago. I believe TCU won that game by 70 points, 112 to 42. Right. Um, so this will be a much better early season test for the Frogs to get a good idea of where they are. I think this is addressing partially one of the biggest complaints TCU fans have had about Jamie Dixon's scheduling practices, especially when it comes to non-conference, that they are uh, pretty weak, that they don't really test themselves in non-conference, especially at home. The home slate for non-conference has been pretty brutal over the last several years. Um, but getting Arkansas to come to Fort Worth, even though it's at Dickies and not at Schulmeyer, is, is is pretty fun. TCU will also play Vanderbilt at Dickies on December eighth, um, <clears throat> as part of a back to back doubleheader of TCU basketball games, where the women's team will also be playing defending national champ South Carolina and Don Staley, an icon, Don Staley. It's so cool to, and you know, um, Mark Campbell said this right when he got in. Uh, when he got into this job, he's like, the non-conference schedule is locked in for this year, but trust me, it's it's pretty soft, and we're going to change that moving forward. And not only did he schedule South Carolina for a game at Dickey's, he's got NC State, a Final Four team this year, coming to Schulmeyer cool. some point in November as well. I believe it's like November 15th. It's on a Sunday. Um, just just really fun basketball coming to the Schulmeyer and Dickey's Arena this fall for Horned Frogs fans. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, it's a win for South Carolina, and they, they get to play in a place. They, I mean, they they'll have a uh, and M in, in Texas, I guess, in state. So, but it's just another way to kind of plant a recruiting flag for them in, in North Texas. But um, the, the fact that Mark Campbell is the kind of coach that that can get the defending national champs to travel to come play his squad, squad out of conference is, is pretty stinking cool. Um, and, and again, it's going to be an unbelievable test and South Carolina um, lost some really great players, but also just reloads every single year. And, and they had a freshman that came off the bench. It was almost their MVP in the national championship game. So um, I, I think there is obviously so much um, potential for this team and to have an early season test like that. This is not a young PC women's basketball team. They're mm -hmm. veterans. And so if they do, if they do get smacked a little bit, I don't think it'll set them, set them back too much. But if they can play with South Carolina um, and show that they belong at that high level, uh, the confidence you can you can build from a game like that is is unbelievable. Um, NC State, I think, graduated uh, a good portion of their roster, but they still bring back a lot of talent as well. So um, massive cap tip to Mark Campbell for being willing to schedule um, at this level, for, for being willing to challenge his team um, and to wanting to get them prepared um, in every way, shape, and form, not just for – beyond the Big 12, but a Big 12 slate that's going to be really, really loaded, too. I mean, the, the women's conference is almost as strong as the men's. Um, so it's it's going to be a lot of fun. And again, like it, you want to win every game, but but as a fan and even as a player and a coach, you also want to see what you're up against and what you're capable of and, and what, mm -hmm. what better way to do this in front of a, what I'm sure is going to be just absolute massive, crazy crowd at Dickey's Arena. Like what a gift for the fans, too. This is going to be really, really cool. Yeah, super excited for TCU fans to get some good fall basketball under their belts uh, in the heart of, of football season. Um, pretty cool. And hey, you know, if things work out really, really well, that December 8th is a Sunday where TCU mm -hmm. plays Vandy and the women play um, South Carolina. December 7th is a Big 12 championship. So oh, could be could such be, a great weekend. Could be a pretty pretty awesome weekend for Horned Frog fans. Last note before we dip out. Peyton Tolley was drafted 50th overall in the MLB draft this year by the Boston Red Sox. He signs his contract with Boston. He will be going to the franchise uh, at Fenway for over slot value uh, by about mm -hmm. um, $170,000 over slot value. I think it was 1.8 something was the slot. He signed for just a little over $2 million, uh, which was so, so cool for, for to see uh, for him. And TCU's getting a, a guy back from the draft. Uh, Cademan Parker was drafted in the 11th round by the Milwaukee Brewers. He did not come to terms with them, so he didn't sign, and he will be coming back for another season for the Horned Frogs. So they get a, a good, talented arm back on the roster um, who really started to shine near the end of last season when he was getting further and further away from his Tommy John surgery. So excited to have Cademan back in purple and white for another year. Excited to see what Peyton Tolley starts to do as he begins his professional journey uh, with the Boston Red Sox. The, the draft almost could not have gone better for TCU baseball. Yes. 
Yes, uh, we, mean, can, we, can deep dive. Yeah. we can deep we'll, dive. Yeah, we can deep dive later, but yeah. Ball starts, but yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of reasons to be really enthusiastic um, about mm-hmm. what this rebuild will look like and what TC baseball can do in the spring. So, but like you said, yeah. there will be time to talk TC baseball. We yes. are knee deep in TC football. We are. We will have lots of content on the Frogs Insider Instagram um, and and both of our Twitter accounts tomorrow. I'm sure. I'm sure Dana will give us plenty uh, plenty of quotable moments. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you aren't following us on Instagram uh, to follow Frogs Insider, check out the TikTok. I'll eventually get logged into that too. I'm sure. I'll you know, figure it out. Online. I'll figure out what the password yeah. is. Um, but but yeah, like we're we're posting videos, photos, all the press conferences. We'll we'll do more social clips and stuff too as we get uh, closer to the season because because we're able to do this together again like in person I'm which is so, so fun hyped. very excited yeah and, and maybe next time my furniture is coming on friday so so supposedly so maybe maybe ne- maybe next time i won't sound like um you know I'm, I'm speaking out of like a tin can she's sally from the bottom of the well lassie hasn't gotten to her quite yet oh. <laughs> But uh, Lassie, yeah, this is my only hope. <laughs> this has been the Frogs Insider podcast. We will be back next week with another episode. Until then, like Melissa said, follow us on TikTok, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter at the Coach Melissa and at Frog Preacher, and we will talk to you next time. Go Frogs! Go Frogs! <laughs>